Mm. As a physician, I was trained in the allopathic medicine, right? So mm-hmm. that means we learn about the diseases, we learn about what went wrong and diagnose, and then we bring in the therapists that were trained and then give them the medications and they're supposed to get better, right? The problem was uh, we are trying to treat the whole person with only external things without really taking it what kind of mind he has, what kind of feelings he has, what kind of experiences he has, how he is going to take them. You know, uh, some people may take the medications okay, some people uh, may need more than that, you know, to understanding their experiences and all that, you know. And then uh, everybody is pursuing this happiness to get from outside. I go and make money, I go and make a name for myself, or I have a status, you know, you know the routine that we pursue happiness, right? But actually we are pursuing for things to give us pleasure and that doesn't last, you know. Even if you have so much money, so much fame, like uh, Robin Williams, uh, he was a famous comedian, you know. I loved his comedy and suddenly he commits suicide. That is an example of saying, okay, this lifestyle that we were said to believe in are not enough and people are feeling empty inside and then die. And Mm. then my yoga practice uh, said something, uh, you know, it's an ongoing study, right? And in the study, somewhere they said, the ancient yogis did not pursue happiness. They discovered this from within. And then they march the life with tremendous achievements in art, music, literature, sculpture, you name it, they had tremendous uh, creativity and also they were in flow when they were doing these things. <clears throat> the quality was very high. Hmm. That was one thing. So I wanted to find out what was that, that they were able to go in and find out and then establish in that and then work with psychological independence of anything. So mm-hmm, they were mm-hmm. contented, they were ever fulfilled, and they were found the fountain of happiness there. So what surprise, surprise is, it is there in everybody. The only thing mm-hmm. is we were not led to uh, discover that with so many isms, so many fundamental things. You have to be in this religion, you have to worship this God, you have to do these things, all the, none of it. Actually, our misunderstanding of how humans work is the root cause of that, not able mm-hmm. to understand what it is. So what it is, is we have the body, we have the mind, where all the thoughts, emotions, uh, everything happen. And also we have somebody who is experienced this body, experience this thought. That is real us, that witness. See, thoughts are happening to you. You are not the thoughts. The supposition was we are the thoughts and according to the thoughts, we identify ourselves like this personality, this particular taste we have, this particular way of mindset and all that, you know. Just take a breath and then just ask yourself, am I this body? Well, yeah, I have the body, but me having the body and then Mm -hmm. me having the thoughts who is that me that is what they turned inside and stayed with that one by one one by one finally it is not the analytical mind that discovers it you feel it you know you are alive you feel that life force within you you don't have to name it and describe it and analyze it to the death That's the mistake we were doing. We thought everything is intellectual, everything we can find, but okay, you can do everything outside. Science can objectify things and study them and make a theory, test it, and give it out to us as a tool, as a technology. That's all fine. External life, we go with intellect and we study, we learn, that's all fine. But our own first-hand experience is not analysis. It's my experience. I feel it. So to know who you are, we want to feel it intuitively. Mm -hmm. And then 
established in that intuitive self. Hmm. Once you are there, then you say, okay, thoughts are coming to me, but I can follow this thought and do what I want to do with it, or I can let it go. That is basically meditation in nutshell. Don't hmm. fight the thoughts, don't resist them, but don't indulge in them too all the time. You know, and when you happens, said something about us being uh, very, like, I think you were alluding to us being obsessed with the intellectual, which yes. makes sense because we're very much <clears throat> left-brained species at the yeah. moment. Uh, yes. I was listening to an, a conversation between, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Jordan Peterson. I was listening to a conversation between him and, uh, you know, a friend, a philosopher that he, he knows. And mm -hmm. they were discussing the work of his friend. His friend studies the, has studied for a large mm -hmm. part of his life, the mm -hmm. consciousness. What is consciousness? How can you describe it? What, what, how would you tell someone uh, how to recreate, you know, like a, a, that, that, the same situations where consciousness is, 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 is prevalent, where you can actually really yeah. recognize it for what it is. Exactly. And it was a fascinating conversation. I'm not going to butcher it because I'm probably, I can't recreate it the way that he did. But uh, essentially, like I said, right now, it feels like we're very left brain mm -hmm. in, in the sense that we see <clears throat> everything external and we like to measure things against yeah. you know very uh, conceptual kind of uh, yes uh, you know constructs yeah. and, Let's and, and, and we've, we've neglected the right brain which is the very yeah. kind of like you're saying the very flow yeah. consciousness you know in tune with yourself you use two important words there climate one is measure and there is concept okay what we are, that feel of it, the life force, is not measurable. Mm -hmm. It is something immeasurable. It is in us, outside too. I also breathe in that life force, then I am alive. If the breathing stops, I am declared dead. Mm -hmm. What is that life force that is coming? Is it visible to me? Can I feel it? Can I grasp it? Can I measure it? No. So that is the fundamental mistake we are making in consciousness is something unmeasurable we want to measure. And also we want to make a concept and follow that concept. It's not conceptual thinking. Thinking is also outside the or is in the consciousness. Consciousness is uh, not in the thinking. Thinking is in the consciousness. Mm -hmm. You are a human being. You don't have to read any books. You don't have to follow anybody's thinking. Feel for yourself right here and now. Who you are, do you feel it or somebody has to tell you this is the concept? If I tell you Clement is uh, such and such and such and describe it, you may not be that concept at all. You may say, I may be that yesterday, but today I'm not. You were angry yesterday, and that was your state of mind you experienced it, and you may have remembrance of it, but actual feeling experience is gone. You can be angry today, but suppose you are angry with me, and I take a conceptual impression of you, and then I walk away. Tomorrow you come, you may be regretting that. You may not be angry anymore. You may be more friendly or trying to reconcile our relationship. But if I carry the concept, I'm not meeting you. I'm meeting my mind-made concept. That's what we do in relationship with everything. Mm -hmm. We have this personality. Persona means a mask. Mm -hmm. That is made of our thought, made ego. And we identify that rather than who we are inside is the human being. We walked away so much from the being aspect into doing and conceptualizing and making a, everything out of thought. Thought has its place in doing things <coughs> mechanical. Suppose I don't know how to switch on the computer, put my speakers on, I cannot communicate with you. So I have to have that now. That is all fine. 
But how that knowledge is used is the problem. Hmm. You want to use it? Yeah. Based on what you were discussing there, I also do think that we, we, you know, if we were only to recognize the importance of mm. giving yeah. someone the benefit of the doubt that maybe they're yeah. not the person they were when we first met them or when we last met them, it's almost like a, a mechanism, mm. uh, like a primal mechanism. You identify this as good or as bad. It's useful. It's not useful. And you remember so that next time you don't have to worry about that anymore or you avoid that because it's dangerous. And so we build up these kinds of ways of categorizing the yeah. whatever we ex experience in the world. But with when it comes to people, when mm -hmm. it comes to very complex and ever shifting personalities and, you know, I, I, I do think we we are in a position where we have to ask ourselves, can this person be something else? Can they be something more? No, Maybe they are already, right, comes from that. They are already that. See what it is, is you essentially human being first. Then you studied, you got a degree, whatever you became. Me, human being first. Then I got an MD, MBA, whatever degrees I have. But I should be identifying only as a doctor to you. I am a human being, you are a human being. In that awareness of what we are, we are common. Everything else can be different. I may have a different culture, I may have a different language, I may have different skin color, I may have money differently. All those things are different. But what the problem is, we identify ourselves with what we accumulated than what we are. All we have to do is switch that. Switch that and meet you, like my patients, for example. Different colors people come, right? Different age group, different genders, different countries. All people come to me and different age groups too. So I like to relate to them as a human being first. Mm -hmm. then you can relate to me as another human being may have professional knowledge about the diseases and all that. But first I'm a human being. My mm -hmm. challenge is come down to that level and relate with you as a human being. That means mm -hmm. you have fears, you have sorrows, you have experiences, I understand how they feel. The mm -hmm. moment you come to that level, you latch on to me because we are common. Mm -hmm. That is the one we forgot as a civilization because we built up these images in relationship. Outward things, they are okay. But when it comes to human being feeling first-hand experience, uh, that is the one that, uh, that is kind of uh, difficult for people because they establish with themselves being an ego. And they establish basically a personality. They establish with the personality their likes and dislikes and all of that, you know. But the problem with that is it divided us, divided our societies, divided our countries, divided us as a people, and divided us as uh, I, these are like-minded people, these are not. So we are relating in a way that's not really produced at anything. It, uh, so many wars, so much violence. So you take from house to society, to countries, to the world, the same conflict continues. I think Eckhart Tolle, somebody said, 130 million people died in uh, 20th century because of this division. Mm -hmm. This division breeds like Germans said at one time, we are the superior people, then everybody else is not, so let's kill all of them. The same attitude continues in some way or other in other places too. Like, for example, these police killings of the black people now, they identify these people are dangerous, uh, and then they have that image of some people maybe, but not all of them, right? But the mm -hmm. excesses happen when they're operating from the image, not with the human being in front of them. See, for me, when I saw something like a, they were sitting on his uh, throat and then uh, I knew immediately he's going to die because three minutes are enough to choke somebody. If you don't have oxygen to the brain, the brain will die. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, whenever somebody is uh, cardiac arrest and they call us to come and revive them, we run. 
because we have mm. only two, three minutes left. We have to go there, we have to open his shirt and pump his heart and all those things, right? Uh, but we run because we know how quickly human life can be extinguished. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If that police person has that human being in his mind and want to take a little bit of time to go further into the circumstances, he may act differently. But his force was from the image he has about black people. So he has to attend to that image and the water is selling, that's it. He doesn't want to see anything the man is saying or the people who are surrounding say. He is just driven by his own conceptual thinking. Hmm. That's where yeah. the domination of left problem, you know. It, it is a, it's a huge, huge issue, the divisiveness today. How would you kind of say that America is different from the rest of the world in politically, socially right now? Because I'm looking at it from a, a, a long distance away. And the yeah. problems that America have are very different from the problems that maybe, you know, other countries around the world have. Yeah. So uh, being there as a foreign, as a, someone who was born in another country, I would imagine, um, living there. I w- yeah, I was born in India in 1955, actually. I'm now 66, you know. But I lived up until 1981 in India. Then I came here, you know. So ever since I've been in the United States, but I go and visit India. Last time was 2010, I think. Uh, my thing is not confined to any particular country anymore. I'm truly global citizen in the sense I don't have any association to anybody because I see the whole globe. That is the you know, perspective, this understanding anybody will come to when they see the superficial differences, you know. But America is an experiment in humanity where if you go back and see how it was formed, people who were rejected, people who are going to persecution and people did not want to be religiously persecuted, you know, uh, they came and then they built an experiment where people can come and realize that potential in America. That is there. You have the chance to really grow into something very much. That that system is excellent, you know. Only thing is the divisional, this left-hand thinking I told you about, that is rampant in the people that can make a difference, like a politicians, the policy makers, you know. Uh, Look at uh, what uh, um, happened in 1960s and 70s. They made a policy of integration. A lot came. But integration in consciousness was not that. People had a law, but in their hearts and hearts, they did not go away with this divisiveness. Because this identification, I am American, or I am this particular state, or a particular society, uh, that identification is not really needed, you know? That means you are divising with other people when you identify. Suppose I'm say I'm only India, Indian origin, then I am dividing everybody else against the Indians. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's why I am happy with the United States because it gives me the... Uh, opportunity to really discover my potential it's so hard and, to communicate yeah. that to someone who hasn't had the chance to travel because unlike yeah. like i feel privileged that i have had the chance to travel i'm sure you feel privileged too and it's but it's so important because it changes the way you <clears throat> yeah. understand our species because we have different cultures and different ethnicities and different ways of life. You don't know that until you see it. You can read it in a book or you can watch it on TV, but it doesn't become real until you're there. So I I genuinely feel, yeah. That's very true. When I was in a small town in India, I remember very clearly when I was six or seven years old, I was, uh, I went to the edge of my street and go to a different street, and the house seemed so new to me, I was scared. I don't know where to go. Like my, Again, I had to retrace my steps and come to the street I was familiar with. Then I was comfortable, I came back. 
But then I was in India up until I was completing my medical uh, degree, right? So a lot of studying. So we didn't travel even in India, all over. We went to the capital of our, our state because my uh, sisters were there. So visit them, we used to go. But rest of them, slowly, I visited that city, this city, and all. But that's all, that much. Then suddenly I come to Chicago. The whole thing is opened up. So, but then when you go to travel uh, places, it may not open you unless you are open to the culture, to the people. So I visited this, uh, the the one who visited me was 85-year-old white lady, Mrs. Host, you know, but she is a German, but she was in Sitlon in America. So she took me to her house and all that, right? Then I was introduced to American culture through living with them, you know. Then you appreciate, but you know what? Whatever uh, people were there in India, heartful, friendly, considering and all that, these two people were like that. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Host. So they accepted me. They kind of invited me into their home, gave me a lot of value, gave me wonderful hospitality. Uh, but when I went out, I discovered so much, so much uh, uh, division in people. Even in, in Chicago, I was in Park Ridge. It's a very nice uh, uh, suburb. I think that's very good uh, suburb. So I, I was in the uh, richest people in you know, among there. But then I traveled to the hospital, then discovered all these uh, black people, all this uh, old and uh, really poor people and all. So I was exposed to cultures. Unless you are really paying attention to what is happening culturally, if you just visiting and having fun and going out doesn't make a difference. Yeah. You are really right though. But now you see how we travel through the internet, even the clubhouse, uh, you may be, where are you right now? Uh, which I'm part in the of UK the at the moment. Right? UK? UK. Yes. Uh, see, you are in UK. I, I am here, Ponda. <laughs> you are on that way. So it's a wonderful thing that we are able to meet through the internet all the people all over the world. Clubhouse, I love that because everybody I can talk to are all over, you know. So yeah. there are means to really get people together. But the thing is, your divisive consciousness that was bred from school to house to society that makes you so entrenched in that to break out of this is terror okay so here's a question to you yeah. how <clears throat> does the normal average working man or woman become self-aware and ele elevate their consciousness to a higher frequency when i say mm -hmm. that we mean become somewhat less obsessed with the external, less yeah. divisive, less superficial. How does one do that? Yeah, all you do is, am I just the thinking or am I this aware human being behind the thinking? If you can realize just that part, then your awareness will lead you to places where you discover lots of things you are missing. Otherwise, you are planted in the thinking, in the things that you think are correct, and this is the only way, and you will pursue that. So just realize, I am not just this body-mind only, but I am that awareness behind it. Hmm. As a human being, if you don't have awareness, you are not a being. A lot of people are neurotically entrenched in their thinking. So all you have to do is, am I connected to the nature? Do I smell it? Do I see it? Do I enjoy the sunrise? Do I enjoy the sunset? Am I connected to animals? Am I connected to the young children? Am I connected to other people as people, not as anything else? And if you start with the small things, you will find out yourself, oh yeah, I'm thinking of these things which are not real, all the time, they were gone. So I have a very simple solution people can do. Present moment awareness. Mm, yeah. You, you and know, me are meeting, yeah. 
when I listened to you talk about it, and I did study uh, a little bit of the Ayurvedic medicine when I was younger. I went yeah. to university and I, I studied natural uh, naturopathy. Yeah. So, um, and they did talk about uh, yeah. Ayurvedic medicine and traditional Chinese nice. medicine. And it very much is a very basic <clears throat> uh, view of, you know, the human uh, yes. being. And it's not uh, hyper conceptualizing things. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was listening to you explain it, there was a part of me that was thinking, I, I can understand how silly that sounds, you know, to think of these small, insignificant yes. things like a sunset or the air and how it smells and the trees. And, you know, to, to some people that might sound silly, but I'm, I'm very fully aware it's not silly. I'm, I'm actually, it is fascinating how when you're able to let go of the need yeah. for complexity, that things yes. suddenly start working out, you know? It's, it's very simple, Kevin. I am here, right? I'm looking at the trees there. They're budding these leaves, which is a very beautiful green. This is the time of the spring, right? Things are coming up. If I'm in touch with that uh, one, I can discover the newly budding leaves. From the winter, everything is bare, right? Now it is coming back, you know? And that is wonderful. If you are not doing all those live, live things, you are dead in your thinking. You are having the same thing again and again. So that's why people are becoming so information overload, brain fog and all that, because they are not living. They are mm. just... Uh, you know, we are getting in that dead uh, mechanical thinking. But where is the life is? For example, uh, a Sadhguru is a sage that he comes to all over the world. He went to Michigan to visit his um, uh, guests, you know, they invited him out of something, his host. You know? And this lady has a house on the lake. There is a big lake there. And then uh, on the lake, she has this house. And uh, she had been uh, going her life every day. You know, a lake is there and she is there. She is going her routines. It so happened that night is moonlight, right? And uh, he comes and then he kind of talks to the river. And they said, let's go on the lake, on the boat. And she also enters in the boat with him and discovers the beauty of the moonlight on the lake for the first time. She was living there for 10 years. Never really? went on the lake, never went on the lake on the moonlight. Wow. So how much you are missing? The best things in the world are free. Hmm. How, how are you oh, an allopathic doctor practicing, you know, traditional or let's yeah. say alternative because I don't I don't really regard it as like alternative, but let's just say alternative medicine. I don't consider alternative because healing and wellness was the essence of ancient, either it is Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Egyptian, American Indians, you know, the mm -hmm. native Indians here, Australian Aborigines, uh, or like Hawaii. You take anywhere, you take ancients, they were Maintaining, preserving wellness. Okay? Now, in the modern society, there are so many things that are crept on us in the society, unknowingly probably, uh, the lifestyles that were not good for the wellness maintenance. On the other hand, they don't take care of that part. What they do is, if you get uh, spoiled, or your wealth gets spoiled by the lifestyles that you have, then you get sick, then they treat you. Mm -hmm. Trauma is something fine. Urgent care, something fine. Acute hospitalizations for real disease, that's fine. It's the chronic diseases what we are doing, I have a problem with. I am not on any medications now because I understood what is that wellness and living that wellness practices. Natural. Be awake while you are working. Sleep 
only uh, with a certain uh, way, you know, then you don't spoil that natural circadian rhythm. Mm. Can you can you explain what the circadian rhythm is, just so that people know what we're talking about? Yeah, when you wake up in the morning, you are aware, awake, and then you go about your business. You eat because you are hungry, and then you go, and then you work all day. And then in the night, again, the system goes uh, to sleep because it needs that rest and all that. And then there are methods in the body that secrete juices, digest uh, food, and make it conversion to energy, and then uh, eliminate the waste, right? When all these things are allowed to function naturally, there is an intelligence in the body that preserves that balance. That is the through the circadian rhythms. So flowers bloom, then they become, you know, go to the ground. Then they become the manure for the next life. So in our body also, a lot of cells have only certain lifestyle. RBC, for example, 120 days. After this, new uh, thing will come up. So in your body, all the skin sheds, Okay, there are so many new cells happen. So your body six months ago is gone. Hmm. Your body is completely new. You can see that, you know. But body is intelligent so much, if we don't interfere with like a dominant thought, it functions. Very. For example, you are awake now. Then you go to sleep. First you will sleep and uh, dream a little bit. And then you'll have a deep sleep where you don't even know the mind. And then you get up after that because that's not under your control. You, even if you want to wake up for three, four days afterwards, you have to sleep. Otherwise, you won't be normal. You know? So that body intelligence has this rhythms whereby it goes from day to night. Body also goes according to that. But there's connection with the universe connection with uh, uh, all the stars, connection with the moon. For example, you have body water, uh, the percentage of body uh, water is 70% in you. Okay? Moonlight attracts this uh, water in the sun, in the sea, all the waves are because of that attraction to the moon. They come and they fall down. Right? Like that, your water is influenced by the stars. If you don't understand how you are interrelated with everything, then you are messing up your system. That's what we did as modern people. Why can't you shut off your mind when you are done with it? Like we are recording something, we are having a conversation, I can use my mind and language to express what I'm feeling. But after that, you know what I do? I do clean the slate. You know how it is done? Because... I'm, when I'm talking to you, I'm here, awake, conscious, completely attitude to you. When I go to the next one, I'll be like that. That means I'm not in the past. Mm -hmm. I'm not projecting future. I'm with you here and now. Mm. Just practicing being conscious, being aware in the moment we live. Mm -hmm. If you bring in something that happened yesterday, like we are beeping about some loss that we had yesterday, and is not going to bring you just by weeping, but you still want to weep about it. That is the problem with the recurrent thinking. And that becomes a habit. That's where the uh, all the uh, new science coming up to, you know, uh, where we kind of structure the neurological structure according to what we do repeatedly. Neuroplasticity. If you take one thought, Think about it unconsciously, like somebody slapped you. And then more than the slap, the insult that you feel, you go on memorizing that. Then mm -hmm. you want to slap yourself every time you remember you slapping yourself. So your own unconscious thought is making that. If you say, okay, that's happened, that's gone, I will forget that girl, and then let me forget about it, then you have no problem. So mm -hmm. being Conscious, being aware, really keeps you in the life. And that life preserves your circadian rhythms and helps you to live a very, very healthy life. This is very important in Ayurveda because you mentioned Ayurveda. 
I think you will understand. What they said was there are five elements. Uh, by, by, by the way, Ayurveda is the is the ancient Indian, uh, Indian. Yeah. medicine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Ayurveda so is based on consciousness. Yoga is based on consciousness. You know, all the herbs and all those things people know are secondary, but actually it's all based on Ayurveda. Five elements of the five elements: uh, earth, water, fire, air, space. Right? If you you are made up of these five elements because you need space to stay. You have a you know a fire, a uh, metabolic drive to keep you going. You have earth that is the grass, bones, and muscles and all that. You know, and you have the air. Obviously, it goes in, and you have the water. Right? These things they combine in a certain way and they form three bioenergies. You know. If you are those bioenergies, they call them doshas. If the bioenergies are in proper order and they come from your genes, how your father, mother had those genes combine and give you those three bioenergy combinations, you know. And accordingly, you have a mental attitude, you have a psychological attitude, you have a physical attitude. And if you are balanced in those three bioenergies, you are in health. You are constitutionally, you are. That they call prakriti, nature. Prakriti essentially means nature. Naturally, you are there. But if you do things to really play with this dosha, this bioenergies, then you are changing your constitution, your uh, circuit rhythms and everything. That is what is happening in the modern life. How many people get up and be awake all day while they are working? How many people feel sleepy and sleep at a decent hour? How many people not have this sleeping problem? See, I, with, um, whatever is going on with me, when I want to sleep, I sleep completely beautifully, like a child. I may be in the uh, hospital, but even if I sleep for 20 minutes, that rejuvenates me because I have quieted the, my mind before I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But now what we do, we look at the phone, look at the iPad, we look at everything and we bury all those things right into our mind. That's the problem with the information age. I'm an informatician, right? My thing is I deal with information, big data. But I know the problems with the data accumulation and not have to deal with it properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are doing so many podcasts, right? How mm -hmm. many podcasts you want to bring in to island this there, island that there, and then bring it into this conversation. So that means you are completely into that. Mm -hmm. If you are like that, you know what happens? The mind is so well trained to calm down whenever you want. Use it when you really need it. But then after that, don't bury yourself in that experience. That's over. You are watching a sunset today, don't compare it to something else you have seen. Just be with the sunset. Don't name it. Don't compare it. Enjoy the experience. After that is done, next one, you'll be present. Mm -hmm. What is it about our kind of obsession with bringing our thoughts to be more powerful than what we're experiencing? Like, so for example, let's say I'm outside and I'm taking a walk, maybe with the dog. What is it about our way of life that is allowing us to, or somehow provoking us to, to get clogged with these thoughts while there's so much to see already? There's already so much to experience right now. Why do we feel obsessed with thinking about things that aren't even happening right now? That, that is the problem. Unconscious. We are unconscious of who we are and we let our continuously operating thought get strengthened from wakefulness to sleep, sleep to wakefulness again. For example, you, I have a lot of meetings, right? As a physician, even if I'm the clinic, hospital, I have a meeting with a patient, a meeting with a nurse, meeting with the community. I have a committee work, a lot of so you go there, right? 
And you will be doing a lot of this work continuously. And you never give the break to it because you are driving your mind in fifth gear. And then you go home and again, TV and all these things, they fed a lot of information to us. 24 hours these days. At least in the beginning, the 80s when I came in, only three networks, half an hour in the evening. That's it, news. No, we cannot get it, you know. Maybe on the radio a little bit. Then in the morning when you get up, what do you do? You first pick up the devices. So make us establish in that constant uh, uh, nervous energy which has taken its own life. So when you go there, you are with the dog. Pay attention to the dog, what it is trying to do. Pay attention to the people around that is going. Pay attention to the atmosphere. Experience that. Allow your senses. But this other sense, which I call the thought, is dominating so much that is making you unconscious of all these wonderful things. Mm -hmm. See, the lake was there for that girl for, for 10 years. So many moonlights passed. She has a boat also there. She took it only daytime. But she, she missed the, all those moonlight experiences. Do you think that that's why meditation, for example, and yoga as an actual exercise, because yoga to, in yeah. the Western world doesn't mean anything about what, what, it's, what it means in, the, in India or in, in that area of the world. So do you think that that's why know. these things are becoming a lot more trendy now? Because people are actually starting to wake up to the, the yeah. value that they have. Yeah. I think... Uh, a lot of people are doing yoga. That is only physical part they are doing, but that's also good, you know. You can make the physical part also part of this awakening process. Like, for example, if I'm making you do something, do this. Put both your hands like this. Do this with me, okay? And as you raise up, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Deep breath. That opens your diaphragm. And then as you go down, with one exhalation, so do that. That's it. That is a simple bastrika pranayama. But when you do it, you don't think anything. You just pay attention to the air coming all the way from up down level, like a you pay attention to the air going out. That means you are being aware in this moment. Mm -hmm. You are being present. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, you be in the present, then that becomes, that's the thing. Be aware, do complete inhalation, exhalation, and also alignment. Have the alignment in both sides by doing yoga. So awareness of that brings your practice much higher. Mm. And this like I do this in the morning, I have the presence. Then I carry that like a perfume through the activities. Even I am talking to you, I am aware of where I am, what I am doing, who am I talking to, what is our subject, what are the questions. If I take you all the way to uh, Yogastha Kuru Karmani, that's a Sanskrit poem, you know, it says, once you are in yoga, wherever you go, you will be complete. What does it mean? My consciousness connected to the infinite consciousness, that is real yoga. All this body preparation, mind preparation for that. That is what the yoga was invented for. But you are mistaken. It's not just here. In India also, people are drawn to this. Mm. They are yeah. as equally mechanical, as equally materialistic, as equally deviated from the original purpose as anybody else. For me, that in that respect, all world is the one. This consumer culture has invaded all over the world, and we are all one in that. Do you think we'll ever be able to balance modern technology with the ancient yeah. wisdom? I have done that. I am a okay. high-tech person. And also high touch. My my motto, my practice is high tech, high touch. I'm not one of those blaming modern culture is uh, everything. What I am saying is, you did not understand the modern culture properly. You should be above it. You have the iPhone. I am in control of this iPhone. iPhone doesn't drive me. I drive my iPhone. 
that's all we have to have. But then if I'm not in charge of myself, how can you be in charge of something external? So this is this uh, commercialism, consumerism, materialism has sweeping all the cultures aside. And Bhutan, for example, I think there's a documentary comment. Go and take a look at that. And Bhutan, the happiness index. What they had was, they had uh, Bhutan. I think it's a what what the illustrate over what the question what you ask. You know? What they did was they were their culture is only full clothing, simple clothing, but all external needs are not needed. I'm already contented with what I have. I'm happy inside, and that culture went on till the time the governor government allowed this high technology come in there. The moment the satellite and all this, these people left their uh, culture and they became addiction also is a problem. They used to have what's called uh, gross happiness index. Here we say gross product index, right? But there, gross happiness index. It's very fascinating if you look at it. It was one of my lectures also. If you want, you could take a look at the YouTube. It is there, but the, basically what I'm saying is, it's not the culture coming in, it's how we are unaware of the effects and adopting them blindly. I will tell you a very basic thing. I love uh, American football. I'm a Bayes fan. I'm in the New York, Chicago area, right? So I was, uh, I enjoyed so many seasons of them, right? Uh, so I have an affiliation to them. This is my team. We want to win. We want to get the championship, that kind of thing. So we kind of go there. Now. But there was something behind it. I learned how entertainment is making us more mechanical, more pressure oriented, more uh, being high when we win and then low when we lose. We can take both of them equally. So the entertainment industry may be good for the players who are paying physically, emotionally, contest and all that. But the people who are entertained by the watching on the screen or on the ground, they are not really helped by it because they are encouraging inactivity because most of them they sit down and enjoy or at home also. And they're, they're involved in this mind process, seeking pleasure from having this. And that has become a major addiction. Once I saw that, I couldn't enjoy like I was enjoying the football anymore because I have discovered something deeper, much more better. Hmm. So I don't have to watch the games anymore for that. I am in a bliss that is way over top of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But people think, oh, I'm working so hard. Uh, I have to go and see a movie on the Netflix at night time. That's a mistake. Right. Not all Netflix movies are really... Uh, you know, funny or this one, some are violent, some are, uh, you are observing all that disorder in society through the films. And we think, oh, you're very intelligent uh, watching this intelligent movies, we are very well. But that is really destroying our capacity to be awake and aware in the present. Sure. If you, if you could, so here's how I would kind of like talk about that. If you were to spend 50% of the time that you allocate toward entertainment on just simply being alone with yourself, yeah. doing nothing, maybe just meditating or just walking or just, you know, out in nature. I feel like that would be transformative, just I, so transformative for the world. Not, not in 50% climate, start with the 5%. Yeah, okay. okay. It, uh, that, that will lead to that. The only thing is, you have to be at it on a consistent basis. Right. See, there are three principles in spiritual learning. Any language, any culture, the same thing. First of all, listen to what is being told to you. You don't have to accept it. Listen. The act of listening has to be complete. What is Clement saying? I have to listen. When can I listen? If I don't have my own preconceptions going in, then I can listen to something new you are saying. After listening, take that and examine it. Don't believe it. Go into it. Find out the truth of it. 
Once you all your doubts are cleared, then only accept. Here, truth as authority, not authority as truth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just because somebody has said, you should not accept it. You have to examine it for yourself. You have the mm-hmm. intelligence. Then you heard it, you accept it as truth after your own examination, and then you say, is that real in my life? Mm-hmm. I think that's a mix, isn't it, between being self-aware and also yes. having a certain level of critical thinking to be able to, yeah. you know. That's very important. That thinking is very important, not according to the authority as the truth. If somebody said that's the truth. Now you have to say, that is white. Is that really white? Okay. Is that uh, uh, moonlight is there, tranquil, uh, water, I'm on the boat. Is that really real? Yeah. Why, no, yeah, why don't I enjoy that in my life? Mm-hmm. The irony is that I, I feel like the irony is that critical thinking comes from that three-step process. Like critical thinking is a product of being able to fully listen, fully examine, and then fully decide. And then Not you get critical feedback. thinking, but intuitive feeling. When you are, for example, I'm with a patient, I can say I listen to the patient, but he should feel that I'm listening. Mm-hmm. If I'm arguing with you every step of the way, where I'm listening. But if I'm listening to you, I will listen whatever you say without my own mind operating. Critical thinking is good to break analysis and do everything external. You cannot apply that to the subjective feeling. Right. That's where yeah. you have, suppose you are going on that uh, boat, on that lake, on uh, that moonlight. Your experience is your experience. Should I say critical thinking will give you that? No. If you keep off the critical thinking, then you have the experience. Mm-hmm. Qualia, mm-hmm. they call it. First hand experience. This right. is from the from the quantum mechanics. You can go to the strands and everything. Ultimately, that material experiences something because of the spark of consciousness is a qualia first hand experience is yours. I can describe it. I can say this is the way it should be. But when you who is experiencing is you, that is your subjective experience. If you have only critical thinking, you have very little this first hand experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I yes. see, I go out to the dog and immediately I see a big dog coming from there. Immediately I'm afraid that you may attack my small dog is going to hurt the dog, all that, you know. But the moment you go there, they go greet each other and they are friendly. That's what happened to my dog. We had a, 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 a for 16 years we had a, a Shih Tzu. He's a very small toy dog like, you know. But when he goes there, we used to be afraid the big dogs are coming. But when they came, they both are friendly. Mm -hmm. And then they greet each other and then go, you know. So it's a kind of critical thinking interfering with our human experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where you have to be. See, critical thinking came because we are in the forest. We wanted to build a house. We want something. Then that's okay. We want to visit it. All these facilities, everything are making our life easier but not to isolate us from the life itself. I think that's what happened. Mm. Get back to it. Get back to it. Just be aware. Take some time in the morning when you go, am I seeing all the beauty that's around me? Am I awake to that? Am I aware to that? Am I conscious to that? That simple step will introduce you back to the beauty surrounding you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or ugliness too. But either of them are the same side of the same coin, different sides, ugliness and beauty. But then we can fill it with a lot of beauty if you are aware of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we are missing out on, for example, you go out and somebody says, good morning. They don't do mean good morning. They will just say good morning. <laughs> Right? They, they may say, they may say, uh, they may say, I'm fine. They say, 
but they may be miserable but still say i am fine sure where is the life in it yeah right <laughs> you don't even have to ask them just give them a smile and then they like their smile if somebody smiled like that and then they may also smile by them be smiling They have Even the smile happens. sometimes is not a real smile. <laughs> I yeah, think, you know, really. you'll walk past someone, you'll smile, and they'll they'll kind of yeah. you know, do it out yeah, of the, politeness. Yeah, because they are in their own prison of the thought. That critical mm-hmm. thing you were talking about, we don't identify where it is important. It's very important for us to discover things, make things work, and all that. But why do you have to be stuck with that? If I can make a stool out of wood. I can make a stool out of wood, but what is the big deal about it? It's just something we made it there. Mm-hmm. I think that's what happened to the ancients were. They were very in touch with the nature. And yeah. we somehow lost that. We have yeah. to bring it back into our life. Uh, maybe plant a tree or garden every day or look at the children in a playground or they look at your own uh, spouse or anybody with that kind of uh, you know just ask accept them without any uh, critical analysis on them you know then you are touched with the being and they feel it mm-hmm. they feel it when you are accepting with all the pros and cons you, you are accepting them because they are the being and that is actually unconditional love when you have a conditioned self within you you cannot be loving you are only wanting them the way you want them for their convenience yes. but once they are out of that they have a different taste than you you like pineapple they like mango i don't like you because you you like mango how how does it look <laughs> that's what we do is lot of things you know you have to think like me otherwise i won't accept you like minded they say you know but the like minded is only thoughts uh, this is another critical thing that made a difference for me was there are two types of uh, meditation one is manolaya and there is manonasha manolaya means whenever thoughts go up we kind of suppress them slow them down and all that. but then they come again you have thinking so high you want to relieve from that then you want to quiet down you sit down breathing or you sit down do some mantra japa whatever you cut cut and then it comes okay. but this manonasha is where you don't have that coming up again it's always lies there what is this mean is you figure out what is thought how does it come initially we are in silence okay out of that silence these thoughts come but our thoughts are so noisy we cannot discover the silence this restlessness of thought goes down and dullness of thought goes down obviously when you see me i am not a dull person but when i close my eyes my thoughts are quiet mm-hmm. that is the mastery you will get over thought by understanding what is the ego what is the mind is it really existent or not then you find no there is nothing like a ego structure that's all i made out of thought there are only thoughts and that thoughts so so you can allow them to go like a cloud in the sky don't involve in them or don't reject them let them pass like a heart beating thoughts happen in the mind but if you have a goal you want to think certain way that is fine but if you want to have images and things about people that's the problem so you and me were still, uh, talking to each other you have an impression about me that comes into your mind just watch let it come mm-hmm. don't fight it don't don't, write, don't resist it, it. Yeah, once it's gone, I'm still there, but your image is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I have a problem. Uh, I think uh, that is one of the biggest problems, uh, you know, with being able to be fully conscious is that you yes. allow your emotions to somehow yes. cloud your uh, presence. 
you yeah. identify with them and you uh, resist them many times exactly. resistance is 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 terrible it's a uh, I, I am a big believer in energy and the channels of energy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you are yeah. right. That's the only thing that's present. Only energy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You are absolutely right. Energy is the only one that is present. And we mess it up by interfering with it. See, even I still also talked about energy. M C square. This energy, Tesla talked about it. And Tesla is a fascinating figure if you really study him, you know. So ancient India talked about his energy. It's all one energy. And this is what I talked about last week with my friends about how to not to deplete our energy. I can teach you from morning till evening, you can be in everlasting energy. It's not something difficult. We just have to see the perspective and examine it. And if it is, then practice it. Mm -hmm. For example, you have some people deplete your energy the moment you see them. Because you had arguments with them. You don't agree with each other. You hate each other's guts. So you don't want to even see each other. (laughs) Right? We have some people like that, right? Uh, And then uh, a boss that is wanting work to be done this way, but you know it is better to do if you work this way. And then you get frustrated because you are going to fail if you follow his path. Then you are blamed for failing. So you feel frustrated and then you tell them, I know you cannot leave the job because you need the job, but your energy is going to, what do you do? Then you have to see your own energy depleted by hanging on to his image. You should dare enough to do the proper job once the product is done, then show him, see, this is why I said this way it is good. You know? And all he cares about is the end of it is proper work, right? Otherwise he will blame you, it is not of court. You mm-hmm. know? So mm-hmm. there are so many bosses like that, that will do. So how do you protect your own energy it depends upon what reactions you have to the external events. Example, as a hospitalist, when I go there, there are so many patients for all of us, you know. I have 17, other one has 17, like that we distribute. Our job is to go and see what their problem and order everything, and the other people will do all that, right? But then, these people, first of all, they are reluctant to take new patients, and they curse that, and then they go with an attitude of, they are dumping work on me, and then all their energy is going down by their own inner fear. But if you go, okay, yeah, the more the merrier, I want to serve these people, that's why I'm here. Let's go and enjoy my service. And you go there, and you are happy, and you are doing the uh, patient care. A patient appreciates that. He gives you energy back to So at the end of the day, you are full of energy, not depleted. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All I want to say is there is something like an everlasting energy. Right. That is fascinating. I'm sure that that would be an entire episode or more by itself. (laughs) (laughs) You're right. You're right. This is a great, uh, uh, I think this is a great uh, topic to, to, to end the conversation on then is like that everlasting energy as a kind of like a end goal. Uh, and mm-hmm. it all stems from everything we talked about before. Yeah. Um, I'm really yeah. happy that you came on at such short notice. And it's been yeah. a really comprehensive yeah. conversation about consciousness and yes. self-awareness and, you know, uh, all, you know, that traditional Ayurvedic principles yeah. yes. uh, that I think, you know, many people don't know about them, but they're fascinating. So I highly recommend if anyone's watching or listening to this, that to look into yes. it. Where can people get in touch with you and find you if they should want I to. Just, want to. I just founded a company called Be a Pal, LLC. Right. You know, what is Be, Be a Pal? Be, be a friend, but then there's hidden uh, philosophy meeting in that. Be means just be yourself. That's what we talked about. Be your conscious being. Okay. A is awareness. Be awareness. Hmm. P is be in the present. Another is 
pay attention to every action through the day. L is be loving. Not asking for love. You be the love. Be wow. loving. All these things, again, oriented towards consciousness, happiness inside, and how we can manage our body and mind better. But people come with simple requests like, I, I want to feel better in my body. I want to have stretches and all that. I teach them from beginning to advanced yoga, you know. And mm -hmm. if you want to take further into what is real yoga, what are the intricacies, I will take them too. So I'm doing one-on-one -on -one consultations if the people want it. And I'm doing the uh, Saturday morning, 9.30 Central, you know. I do the uh, this uh, satsang, we call it Association of Good People. You don't have to belong to anything. You don't have to convert to anything. None of that. Just be good people, association, talking about things, talking about life, like we both talked, you know. Uh, that's the kind of thing. I do every Saturday. I started in last January 2020 yeah. when, the, when the pandemic is breaking down. And I first started like uh, giving information as a physician to everybody, what's going on, what's happening. Because I follow WHO, I follow major, uh, you know, uh, heads in the field, you know, so that I know that as a physician, other people may not know about it. So I bring them and express them. But at the same time, the spirituality and all this I bring in so that they can take practices, do them in their life. What kind of... Is this on Zoom? Yeah, Zoom. So. Oh, right, Zoom. Okay, got it. 9.30. I think you can uh, come and attend uh, uh, if you want to, you know. Yeah, um, sure. The, uh, the, uh, you can write on the ID if you want to. Maybe other people can write to you. ID is 825-070-2502. Password is 277-269. That is on Saturdays, uh, 9.30 a.m. Central, you know, Central Time in the U.S. You know? So it's kind of, I don't know what time it would be in the U.K., uh, but uh, that is the time I meet people. And also on uh, Wednesday on Clubhouse at 4 p.m. Central, I'm doing therapeutic lives. And then today we started this uh, California Clinicians Club. Uh, I mean, they made me main thing. I thought I was going to go there as a participant, but they made me mind. I didn't mind sharing my thing. A lot of people came and we had a very good time. Uh, that is called MD practice, how the healthcare and states what are the things we can change that kind of thing. thank you so much Rao it's been a real pleasure yeah.